Facebook, Billy. You know, it, uh, it takes a lot of strength. And yes, uh, children, Sunday school, all yours. Rose is ready to lead you down the hallway um, at the moment. You know, I mean, you think about it. How many of us, there's not many, who would drive two and a half hours to come sing in front of a group of people that mostly they don't know yet, right? So uh, thank you, Todd, for sharing with us this morning. We're always looking for more people, by the way, if you're watching online on Facebook and you can sing or play piano or play guitar, we're always looking for more. <laughs> we are. We're going to jump right into Scripture immediately this morning and, uh, and on purpose, if you don't mind. We're going to start in Luke. And if you remember, Luke knew Peter, Paul, and Mary, and James, and John, too. Some of you caught that. <laughs> not, not all of you are old enough to remember who Peter, Paul, and Mary are. So Luke gathered testimonies from all kinds of people, including Mother Mary, if you will, who knew Jesus, and he put them together in his version of the gospel that we read 2,000 years later. So after the death on the cross, after the resurrection— and Jesus walks for 40 days, seen, talks to people, heals people, eats with people, you know. He then is walking and talking with the disciples along the side of the road, and they don't recognize him, right? And he says to them, peace be with you, at which point their eyes are opened, and they can see who he is. Oh, you might have to be hitting forward, Kathy, because it doesn't, maybe I need a new battery. Slide to the scripture. Oh, no, you have to go. I know why it won't work, because you have to go back to out of the Facebook and back into the proclaim. There's a little P at the bottom, so it's the main focus on the screen. Technical difficulties. No, nope, not that one. There we go. Okay. Now I have control again. <laughs> not that I'm a control freak. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> but... You know, now the, now the disciples recognize that it is Jesus resurrected, walking with them. It's not a ghost. It's not a fantasy. It's not some dream that they had. And here's what Jesus says to them. We have fewer scriptures today than we normally do, but the scriptures are longer in their text. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of the Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then Jesus opens the minds of the disciples so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, again, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we just ask that today, as your spirit moves through us, that you would open our hearts and our minds to whatever your word has to teach all of us, me included, that your presence, your spirit, and your gospel will be shared here in the congregation and in our community and in the region and throughout all the nations as you have asked us to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So since you asked me to come on board as interim pastor, Pastor, interim as a title, will go away eventually, I'm sure. Um, here's what we've walked through. What the Church of God, based out of Anderson, believes, believing in what we believe about, the God, about God, about the Bible, about the divinity of Christ, human nature, salvation, the Holy Spirit, holiness. And in all of that, you'll have to forgive me if I gave you the impression that, for instance, we have all absolute truth, and the church up the road there, or the church up the road here, or the church up the road over there doesn't, because that's not true, right? There is one God. There is one Father. There is one Holy Spirit. We, yes, we are based out of the Church of God out of Anderson, Indiana, not the Church of God out of Tennessee, or the other 50 denominations around the world that have Church of God in their label, but what we believe about that does not mean that somebody else's beliefs are necessarily wrong. We stand, since I got here in this congregation, on the posters that are hanging on the wall, on 1 Peter 3.15, right? 
always in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy and always be prepared to make a defense, to make a, a logical response to anyone who asks you for the reason, for the hope that is in you. But do it, not with the condemning nature, but with gentleness and respect. It's not my job, uh, as I've said before, to condemn anybody. It's not your job to condemn people either, right? What's our job? Our job is to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with a broken world, with a broken neighborhood, wherever we are. We are ambassadors. We're supposed to be ambassadors of Jesus Christ. You may or may not know Pastor Tim Mackey or have heard of him. If any of you have seen the Bible Project, uh, Tim Mackey preaches out of Portland, Oregon, and he is the lead minister for that church, non-denominational, that also has created the Bible Project. There are animated videos of every book of the Bible, of all kinds of different theology that are really meant for adults more so than children. And not only can you find them on their website and on YouTube, but they're free. You can download them. We could be using them in Sunday school for the kids, for instance. And if you wanted a five- or a seven-minute overview of any book of the Bible, some of them are a little longer than that or they break it into two parts, it walks you through that theology of the Scripture. So this week, part of my studying and listening to other sermons, I was listening to a lecture just recorded this week with Tim Mackey along with Pastor Tyler Stanton, who's at Bridgetown Church, that's in downtown Portland, Oregon. Both pastors, non-denominational, but by the way, Portland, Oregon is where the uh, Warner Pacific University is in the Church of God University system. That's where we have a, con a congregation and a campus as well. And this is one of the things that Tim Mackey said about the Bible and the entire structure of the Bible. There's something bigger going on, and in terms of the biblical story, what that something bigger is, is that you and I were made to receive love that comes from an infinite source of love. And then we're to reflect that love out into the world by bringing order where there's chaos, by bringing healing where there's hurt by sharing love and generosity where there is lack and where there's hate. This is the human calling to be images of God in the world. And oh, by the way, we just do an okay job and not a very good one of that. He's speaking of all of us in terms of Christianity. So as we work through to the end of February here, and as has happened before, Next week, we're supposed to talk about stewardship, and while I was working on this week's sermon, the Lord said, nope, you still got more to talk about in unity than you can get out in one sermon. Because remember, all of these, since we started back in September, October, you know, these are helicopter views, overviews of what we believe so that we can be prepared to share it, okay? So women in ministry is part of what we talked about last week, understanding that there is no scriptural reason anywhere in the Bible that a woman cannot be a pastor or a leader in a congregation, okay, or hold a board position, right? He created us both, male and female, equally in their image, the image of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. There's no reason that a woman could not be a, in fact, in the Church of God, we have many female ministers uh, within it. And Last week after the service, somebody said, asked me, well, how come Jesus didn't pick any females to be a disciple then? So let's just, a couple of things. Um, you could say, as I said last week, well, you know, he only picked Jews to be disciples too. <laughs> we don't go over to the synagogue in Battle Creek or the synagogue in Kalamazoo or the synagogue in Marshall and say, hey, would you come be our pastor? You know. Um, but if you think about 2,000 years ago in society, uh, you've studied Middle Eastern culture at all, even what we read out of our Old Testament and the New Testament. Women didn't have any rights. In the Middle East, women still don't have a lot of rights in a lot of places. And how would it be seen for somebody who was as divisive as Jesus was, turning the world upside down in terms of power and servants, right? 
if he were to ask somebody to leave their husband to come be a disciple. Or if he was to ask somebody's daughter, understanding that many times in the Middle East and the Hebrew culture they were betrothed to be married at a very young age to leave their work and family to come follow him. That's just not going to fly, right, in, in any sense. But there certainly were women around Jesus all of that time. And he was controversial enough that the leaders in power at the time wanted to kill him. Uh, actually, they did. <laughs> but what they couldn't kill was the truth, right? The truth that he was the Son of God and was resurrected not many days later. After the Last Supper and before his arrest at the Garden of Gethsemane, we read in Luke 22 and in Mark 26 that Jesus prayed. Now, in both of those Gospels, it's a really short little scripture. You may know it. Father, if it be your will, take this cup from me. But if not, your will be done, not mine. But if we go to the disciple that Jesus loved, John has a whole chapter within the scripture of what Jesus prayed about before his death and resurrection at the garden before he's arrested. John 17, and I'm not going to read the first 12. You can read that on your own. Most of chapter 17 for John, by the way, is on the back of your bulletin. So you can take it home and just lay hands on it to pray over those who are ill and need some assistance. But also so you can pray scripture. We'll talk about that in another sermon. Now I am coming to you. This is Jesus praying to the Father. He's coming home because he knows he's going to get crucified, right? And these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word. And the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Right? As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself. He's getting ready to be tortured and crucified for our behalf and for their behalf. And that they, talking about the disciples of the Lord, may also be sanctified in truth. But look at this. I do not ask for these only, Father, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them. Remember, he said that we would do even greater miracles than what he did. Right? And the disciples did, shortly in Acts. Uh, the glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one. I in them, you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you have loved me. That's a long prayer. But of course, most of the time Jesus is praying in that example we have throughout the Gospels. We don't know exactly what he's saying, right? But how much of an example is he to us and how much prayer is necessary on our part? Critical to be in unity with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirits. Not, not just as individuals, but as a congregation in this room, as believers in Christ, what do we say in the church of God? Every blood-washed one is welcome. By the way, how many of you have played with artificial intelligence? I hopped online this, morning, this week because I couldn't find a graphic that was Jesus praying in the garden the way I wanted. And I said, give me an image. Create an image of Jesus praying in the garden. And that's what an artificial intelligence created online for us this morning for me to use. It could probably could be used for bad things, too. That's just not how you and I operate, right? I, I think it's important for us to recognize the fact that Jesus, in his prayer here, just the last four verses of that chapter in John, 
I do not ask for these only, for the disciples, right? But also for those who are going to believe in me through their word. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, James, Paul, all the others within the New Testament, you know, and then the Hebrew Bible as well that we read from, that we still look at, that we, in reading his word, might become one. For those who will believe in me after the disciples are gone. All followers of our Lord and Savior Jesus, Jesus Christ in reading the Word of God, in hearing the Word of God, could be united. One with the Father, one with the Son, one with the Holy Spirit. They are never in opposition to each other, right? They are always, the three of them, the Trinity, are always united. We read last week in Acts, and we were talking about, in particular, after the ascension, they had gone back to the upper room, and they prayed together, and by lots in part, but in unity they chose Matthias over justice to replace Judas Iscariot as the twelfth disciple, right? And the women were there equally with the men in praying and in working together. Luke closes out chapter 2 of Acts, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers. And awe wonder of God came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. People were being healed. Notice the bold here. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. They were in unity. They were all together, one spirit, in agreement, no arguments, no fighting, no, well, you have to dress this way to come into our building kind of thing in any sense. Some of us have experienced that in the past. Right now, you know, we're on a break from Wednesday nights, but I can tell you that it really slightly pains me not to be here on Wednesday nights breaking bread with you, in part because cooking for other people is, as Kathy will tell you, is one of my love languages as well. But we do get together for holidays, right, with other family and friends. We're having a Valentine's Day luncheon in two weeks after Valentine after that service. Whether somebody's single, married, partnered, doesn't matter. Everybody's welcome. So when somebody graduates high school or a trade school or college, when somebody gets married, when somebody gets pregnant or brings a new life into the world, or as we have experienced recently and in many cases in our families, extended families, when someone passes from this life into eternity with heaven, in, with the Lord, we gather, we break bread together. You know, again, a week from tomorrow, we're going to do that for Mark downstairs. And during those times, we share narrative stories when we gather together, you might say, about what we remember, what we experienced, right? What we enjoyed what happened. And in our case, if we're talking about the gospel and what God's doing in our life and sharing the gospel, what we're sharing is what he's done in our lives. And of course, we also share with each other things we need him to do in our lives. This one's, this picture's downstairs. You can't see it quite. It's cut off, but it's from 2011, a gathering here in the Church of God. And if you think about that right after Pentecost and the Holy Spirit comes on them and the Lord is adding to their number daily up to 3,000 become saved, right? That's what they're doing. They're telling stories and people are asking questions. Hey, were you there with him during the three? The, the, I don't know if they'd say three or three and a half years that we talk about his ministry here on earth. Did you see him after the resurrection? Where's that guy who was crippled? (laughs) 
right? Where's the person who was blind and now can see? Is Lazarus here? Where's I got to meet Lazarus, right? I mean, that's what they're doing. They're at raising their hands. They're asking questions and sharing stories about what Jesus did, about what Jesus said. And that begins the formation of our Bible. I we went back to it. I'm not going to pull the scripture back up again. But all who believed were together and had all things in common. They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need within the congregation, as you might call them then. Day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day, those who were being saved. Some of us can remember hippie communes of the 60s and 70s. <laughs> kind of sounds slightly similar to that, but without some of the drugs, probably. But the thought to me of how the Holy Spirit is moving in Jerusalem at that time, you know, just fills my heart with joy. I, you know, the unity of being together. I mean, many of us have been on teams whether it was a work team or a sports team, a debate team, I suppose, you know. And the sense of accomplishment that comes from working with others to accomplish a common goal together is hard to describe, you know. Hopefully the Lions can do that this afternoon over San Francisco. The Lions lay down with the 49er Lambs, something like that. I saw a poster already that says, this is Ford Field, it's been moved to San Francisco. But in the early church, the early church is like the church of today. It's made up of people. And, you know, as I'm teaching during the week, I often say, life would be so much easier. We'd be sending less people to prison, for instance, uh, if we just didn't have to deal with people. <laughs> because people are difficult and complicated. How many, okay, how many have seen Men in Black way back 1997, the first one? That came out. So just as a reminder here, Tommy Lee Jones, Will Smith, not to be the men in black, not to be confused with Johnny Cash, that's a different men in black kind of thing. But Will Smith's character has just seen aliens for the first time. And the two of them are sitting at the Bowery uh, by the channel in the harbor and the river, and we get this. secret. People are smart. They can handle it. The person is smart. People are dumb, panicky, dangerous animals. You know it. 1,500 years ago, everybody knew the earth was the center of the universe. 500 years ago, everybody knew the earth was flat. And 15 minutes ago, you knew that people were alone on this planet. Imagine what you know tomorrow. 2,000 years ago, Jesus rose from the grave, right? Now, you know, there's a couple of things that Tommy Lee Jones and his character there is, is saying. And all we have to do is watch the news to know that we are a broken, hurt species of people. Okay? And sometimes things that we know about between our families and in our community that don't make the news, fortunately, as well. We can see that we are fallen that we are not what we should be. We are frail. We are hurt. And within any given church body across the body of Christ, there is brokenness all over the place. We're not talking about the difference here, for instance, lack of unity between world religions. We're not comparing Hinduism to Buddhism, okay, to Muslim, to Islam, that is to Christianity, within the Christian church, you know. Think about Paul, who was Saul, and knew the law of God like the back of his hand. Watched Stephen be stoned, persecuted, killed Christians, put them in prison, up until 
he met Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. The conflict, if we were continuing in Acts from where we were just a few minutes ago in Acts 2, you know, Peter gets arrested. So does James. You know, the Sadducees brought before Ananias, the high priest, the rulers of that time who are opposite in opposition to what Jesus stood for. Yet, even after they're arrested, towards the end here, Acts 4, still, now the full number of those who believed, everybody who believed in the way, the truth, the life at that point, as the church was called, it wasn't called the church, it was called the way, one heart, one soul. No one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. With great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them. For as many as were owners of lands and houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. They were together. We're going to talk about that scripture a little bit in terms of uh, next week when we, when we talk, continue our talk on unity, but also talk about being responsible for what God has given us. And by the way, this is not, com- I'm not talking about communism. Okay? That's not what that means. But it means where if you have a need and I can meet it, then I'm going to meet it because that's what he told us to do, Right? Already we see in the early church that by the power of the Holy Spirit, they are all of one accord. So different from the conflicts that we've seen over the past 2,000 years, some of which as the church was divided and argued and split and divided again, some of it was necessary, clearly, right? I mean, you know, as we talked about (laughs) last week or the week before, you know. The reason it's called Free Methodist is because you didn't have to buy your pew from somebody else who bought it and owned it and then rented it so you could have a seat in church. That's not, that's not uh, an acceptable thing. Or you could do anything you want in life and just go to the Catholic Church and give them a large chunk of money and then you were forgiven and you could go back to doing what you shouldn't have been doing in the first place. Okay, And I'm not condemning those or those other denominations. I'm just saying that that's not why he created us to be in unity together. Now, among the New Testament letters, all of them, if you historically were looking at when documents were created that we know they were created, the first one to come out is actually James. It's not Acts. Acts comes together another couple of years later that Luke consolidates his interviews and he releases it. James, if you remember, is the brother of Jesus. He's also the old, well, he would be after Jesus, of course, but the oldest brother. Matthew, and when the reason we know he's the oldest is because Matthew describes four brothers and two sisters of Jesus, and James is the first one listed. And if you go into 1 Corinthians, it tells us that the first person Jesus appeared to after the resurrection is James, his brother. For those of us who've had brothers, you know, you and I were talking earlier about your brother Rick. There is a special bond sometimes. It could be between sisters too, don't get me wrong. But, you know, Jesus doesn't appear to the disciples first. He doesn't appear to his mom first. He appears to James first. And that's the point that James believed that Jesus is the Messiah and the risen Lord, right? Not when, I mean, you know, if you think about the communities, right? So, for instance, when he raises Lazarus from the dead, and Jesus' family all knew Lazarus' family, they don't believe then (laughs) that he's the Lord. That's just something strange. But now that I've seen him alive after I know he was crucified, you know, now he's the risen Lord. So, the book of James is written, this letter of James is written about 10 years after the ascension, after the resurrection, okay? And we don't know who James was writing to. It doesn't say I was writing to the church in Corinth, for instance, or the church in Thessalonica. Um, But clearly there's something wrong within whatever church that he's writing to, and they're not in unity. 
There's a conflict going on, whether that conflict is about what we practice, how we dress, how we treat each other, however it may be, and James is really unhappy. What causes quarrels? And what causes fights among you? This is the first written conflict we have within the church. Okay? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and you do not have, so you murder. I can't believe, well, there's a lot of things that have been done in the name of the church that are not quite right over the years. You desire, again, and you do not have, so you murder, you covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and you quarrel with each other. You don't have because you don't ask the Lord. You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly, not because you need it to do what the Lord wants you to do with it, but because you want it so you can, I don't know, have a new BMW or something, or a bigger boat or a bigger house or whatever it may be that's personal. He continues. It's not pleasant. And by the way, this is not for you individually. We're just talking about what James is saying in this conflict, okay? I don't, don't, don't feel like you're being accosted. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? And by the way, it's a weird word, and you can look up multiple translations. Enmity still comes up there, and it means an intense, long-lasting hatred. Love of the world, of things of the world, of possessions, for example, will keep us from the Lord. So, Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose that it is no purpose that the Scripture says, he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? Sorry, I'm hearing David Crowder. He is jealous for me, loves like a hurricane. You're familiar with the song we sang it a few months ago. But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Again, I'm not saying that because there's something you needed to, oh my gosh, what have I been doing? That's not the point. The point is that this is the first documented conflict within the church. Be wretched, mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy turned to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and then he will exalt you. James concludes here, Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. We're not just supposed to be hearers of the word. We're supposed to be doers of the word, right? There's only one lawgiver and one judge. He who is able to both save and destroy. But who are you? Who am I to judge my neighbor? Wow. <laughs> James was not a happy guy. <laughs> Whatever was going on in that congregation, he was not a happy guy, and they definitely were not unified, right? All of that, we actually, you know, maybe James just talks longer than his brother Jesus, because Jesus said, why do you worry about what's the speck that's in your brother's eye when there's a two-by-four in yours, <laughs> you know? Take the two-by-four out of your own eye, and then you can worry about the speck. In it. You know, Jesus had it in a sentence. Here we've got a chapter and a half, very long sentences. But we're talking about unity. So, and we're going to continue this next week. So I, I'm going to wrap this up with a brief confession for you or to share, to share with you from my testimony. Forty-some years ago, I worked for the Assemblies of God up on 44th Street in Grand Rapids. And like a lot of people who had wandered drastically away from the Lord and then come back, you know, I, I'm on fire. I'm doing Bible study in church or at somebody's house four to five nights a week, Right? and studying the Word all the time. And when it's my, within my young and foolish heart, Catholic Church was just evil. You know, I mean, you can look at the Crusades and think some of that uh, as well, and some of the other things that happened there. And, the, you know, some of the Baptist teachings were right. If you didn't go to the Assembly of God and you didn't speak in tongues, then you weren't part of God's church and you weren't saved. You know how much hogwash that is? <laughs> 
<laughs> somebody, can somebody say amen? If John was here, he'd be saying amen in the background. <laughs> you know, right? And then the Lord introduced me to some Catholic friends who were charismatic. Yes, there are Catholics who speak in tongues. Okay? There's one God. There's one Father. There is one Son in Jesus Christ, one Holy Spirit, and there is one church. Now, just like God created all humanity, and we come in many flavors and colors and styles, some of us like rap music, some of us like country. Some of us are a little country, some of us are a little rock and roll, I, you know, however that may be. But we are all still his children. The core beliefs are still the same. What must I do to be saved? Confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior with my mouth. Believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead. Okay? Do, do, do we care if, for instance, we practice communion? We'll do that next weekend. It's the first. We, our tradition, we do it the first Sunday of every month, right? You know, some of us wa do feet washing, some of us don't. Some denominations have seven different ordinances that they practice on a regular basis. That doesn't make them holier than us. It doesn't m make them dramatically different. What did Paul say after he talked to the jailer when the walls came down? Again, confess with your mouth, Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. Believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, and then you and your entire household, salvation will come to your entire household this day, is what Paul told them in Romans. So we're going to talk about unity again next week. We're going to talk about that within the sense of stewardship too. But, and I've got to look at my list here because I don't have them all memorized yet. We are not in competition with the four block away Seventh-day Church, Adv Church, Adventist Church, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, the First Congregational United Church of Christ, Our Lady of Fatima over in Union City, Our Savior Lutheran Church, the Union City Assembly of God, head over east. We're not in competition with the Tecumseh Church of God, which isn't part of the same church of God that we belong to, but that's okay. We're not in competition with the First Baptist Church, the Coldwater Bible Chapel, or the Tecumseh UCC, right? Our competition is with the enemy of the Lord that destroys people, that destroys families, that keeps people from coming to a knowledge of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That's why we continue to say, always be prepared to give an answer for your hope in Jesus Christ, for the joy that you feel, for the peace no matter what's going on in the world or what's going on in my family or my health or my finances. I, I can have peace every morning when I get up because I know who's in charge. Amen? And be able to share that with gentleness and hope. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we're so grateful for what you're doing here in our hearts, in our families, in our community, and what you're going to continue to do as you continue to rebuild what you started here 135 years ago, Lord, in this congregation. We are so grateful that you gave your son as a sacrifice for us that our sins might be washed clean and that you rose him from the grave three days later by the power of your Holy Spirit. And he sits right now at your right hand. Father, there's needs within this congregation and there are needs within our hearts that we have not verbalized with anybody yet. And we just ask, Father, that you would give us peace, joy, and give us this week an opportunity to share your word with whomever it is that you put in front of us that you desire us to share that word with. But as you had us discuss last week, Father, help us to be better listeners and not be so eager to pound people over the head with Christ, but to listen to where they are and meet them as Jesus would where they were to then be healed and move forth as a new creation in Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing two songs to close out uh, today, I think. But uh, we do have to stop the video first. So first, Kathy, you'll have to go over 
to the Facebook page in Microsoft Edge and stop the broadcast.